Welcome to another edition of the Morning Devotional. My name is Pastor William Hill. I'm the pastor of Providence Presbyterian Church located in Evansville, Indiana. We are a congregation of the Presbyterian Church in America. If you'd like to find out more information about the church, you can visit our website. That link will be available to you at the end of the video. Additionally, if you have any questions or comments and you'd like to reach out to me again, um, that information will be provided to you at the conclusion of today's devotional. Today is Friday, January 27th, 2023, and this is edition number 15 of season 8. We are working our way through the Westminster Confession of Faith. We now come to chapter 3, which is on the subject of God's eternal decree. Let's pray first, and then we'll consider paragraph 1 of this uh, of, of chapter uh, 3. Let's pray. Father, as we now <clears throat> come to these very important truths as articulated by our confession and by uh, this historic document that has stood the test of time, that has been very useful and helpful to the church to guide her as an accurate summary of what the Bible, your very word, teaches. We pray that you would help us to understand these things, that you would give us your spirit, for we know that, that these things given to us in your word are for our good. They're there to guide us and direct us in our pilgrimage as your people in this world. We pray that we would not only learn more, rich, more of the richness of this theology, but we would also uh, endeavor to apply it to our very lives. And so be merciful and kind to us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, as I said, we now come to chapter 3 of God's eternal decree. We're going to consider in this edition a uh, paragraph, just the first paragraph of chapter 3. There we read, God from all eternity did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet, so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. Now there is much <clears throat> to unpack here, and I'm going to endeavor to do that in a very brief period. Um, <clears throat> but what we first note that uh, the God that we have considered from chapter 2 has decreed or he has, uh, he has set in motion and uh, with it all of its details, every event, every action, every circumstance, everything that happens uh, to his creation. He does this uh, uh, due to his most wise and holy counsel of his own will. Now, what, what the confession is teaching us here clearly is that God did not need nor did he consult with any creature as to his purposes and plans that he might set in motion, that he might put in place and accomplish all to his glory. We note here that it's wise, it's most wise, as God is most wise, infinitely wise, all that God determines to do, all that God has decreed to do, uh, is rooted in his infinite wisdom. Now that helps us, of course, as Christians, because we might think, well, we just, we're just turned into a bunch of robots and we're just following a program and we really have no um, involvement in it whatsoever. The confession is going to deal with that question um, <clears throat> in paragraph two, but but suffice it to say, it is good for us to recognize immediately that this, what God has determined to do, is most wise. And it is most holy. That is to say that it is not flawed. There is no um, wrong in it in any way. Um, it is rooted in his perfect righteousness. And that which he determines for us as his creatures, as especially for his people, is good <clears throat> and it is useful and it is beyond in many ways, our comprehension. And so we may not be able to plumb the depths of God's decrees. We may not be able to articulate in some logical way or formula uh, because of the weakness of our own uh, fallible minds. <clears throat> but we can have great confidence in the fact that God, who has decreed all things, has done so uh, due to his infinite wisdom and his perfect holiness. 
And so we can trust that which God has determined, things that happen to us during the course of our day, things that aren't necessarily pleasant. No one would say that getting a flat tire on the way to work or um, having some financial ruin or some calamity, uh, illness, disease. We would, no one on a horizontal plane from man to man would acknowledge that that's a good thing and we really enjoy that. We look forward to those kinds of problems. No one wants those. But they do come into our lives, but they come into our lives because of God's eternal decree uh, rooted in his wisdom and his holiness, all for the good, especially for the good of his people. But ultimately, all things that God has decreed will indeed bring him glory. These things are unchangeable. As the confession makes quite clear there, it is or, or unchangeably ordained. Because God is immutable, that is to say he cannot change, these things that he is determined to do will in fact occur. And so when God determined or decreed to create that must, of course, come to pass. And so he did determine to create, and then he did create uh, the world and everything in it. <clears throat> now, when we look at Psalm uh, 33 and verse 11, again, just using the proof text of the confession, I would encourage you to utilize them. I don't cover every one of them uh, just because of time constraints, but I would encourage you to look at them, get a good copy of the Westminster Standards, one that has the verses maybe written out at the bottom, like the one I'm using here before me. Um, they are widely available uh, to purchase wherever. The Amazon Banner of Truth has a very an outstanding edition, but you can get them for free, of course, online as well in PDF formats and so forth. But in Psalm 33 and verse uh, 11, uh, we read there, the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. And so they stand, they're immutable, they're unchangeable. The plans and purposes that God has ordained will indeed occur. The Apostle Paul, in that very lengthy Greek sentence in Ephesians chapter 1, makes reference to this as well. If people want to question the fact that God has decreed all things, they need only to argue with the Bible and refer to it because it clearly states it. Not to mention the fact that I've just read from Psalm 33, but in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so these things, all of them, are decreed by God. They're rooted in His infinite wisdom and holiness. They are unchangeable. They will certainly come to pass. However, it prompts the question, and the Westminster Assembly deals with this question that immediately pops into the head of any reasonable creature, yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin. Now, how does this relate then, therefore? Did God ordain the first fall? Did He decree that Adam and Eve would fall in the garden. Well, certainly, if all things are ordained by God, then he ordained that Adam and Eve would sin. But he did not make them sin, nor did he entice them to do so. They did so on their, out of their own free choice. God is indeed not the author of sin in the sense in which he compels me to do so, or entices me, or even works evil in me, or works sin in me that I might sin or would sin. No, I sin because I'm enticed by my own desires. James chapter 1 makes it very clear, and as we seek to reconcile these matters, we need to take seriously the full counsel of God as he speaks on these, sub on these matters. In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So scripture makes it plain that God does not tempt me. That is an act of the evil one. It's an act of the matters that pertain to our world in which we live and it's matters that, are, that pertain to myself. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. <clears throat> and so we have an example of this, of course, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus himself 
parallel in the very temptation of Adam. Matthew chapter 4, we read, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now the Spirit led him there, but it was Satan himself that actually did the temptation. And so we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What we are praying is that God would keep us from temptation, but if we are tempted, that he would support and deliver us in our temptations. But God in no way causes us to sin. He doesn't entice us to sin. He does not make us sin. We do that because we choose to. We do that because we want to. Now, this all, of course, is rooted in God's unchangeable decree in which he accomplishes his purposes. Even the sin of our first parents accomplished his holy purposes and will. And as one seminary professor told me in class, and frankly, I was somewhat stunned by the statement at first and had to think about it, but he said, knowing what we know about God and all of his attributes, as we've considered from chapter 2, it was good for us that Adam and Eve fell in the garden. Now, that I know and I recognize that that runs contrary to our thinking, but we need to recognize that this, this determination, this decree of God is rooted in his wisdom and holiness. And therefore, we must trust that God uh, made a perfect plan uh, for humanity. And part of that perfect plan was that we would sin, that we would fall. But God did not make Adam do it. He did not work sin in him or evil in him that he might sin. And so God is not the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures. That's the enticement. That's the aspects of which I've already covered. Nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. Now here we have the issue of first cause, second cause. God is the first cause of all things, but God uses means to accomplish his purposes. And one of the greatest expressions of this means of course, we know that Jesus Christ was ordained from the foundation of the world to come and rescue sinners, to offer his life a ransom for many, to purchase back sinful people, to redeem them. But God uses me. He used means to accomplish that, many different means, of course. We have the betrayal of Judas, and we have the acts of wicked people. And so in Acts 2, 23, we read, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, that is to say, the eternal decree, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And so God used the means of lawless and wicked men to accomplish the crucifixion, to bring to pass that which was necessary to reverse the effects of the fall and to rescue sinners. But these men did that, and they did that on their own choice, they did that because they wanted to. God did not work evil in them. They, on their own, because of their own nature, determined to crucify the Lord of glory. Oh, the plan is accomplished, the definite plan that God established, but it was accomplished through the means by which God ordains. We see that all the time in our lives. Uh, God has granted to the church many different means by which he holds us fast in his will, He's given us his word. He's given us worship. He's given us sacraments, the preaching of God's word. He's given us the fellowship of God's people. He's given us many means to employ and use to accomplish both his purposes as well as our good. And so we must be mindful of these things and we must use them. We cannot excuse, we cannot make an excuse and say, well, God, God decreed that I would, that I would uh, rob that bank down the street. Well, you robbed the bank, yes. Well, God decreed it, yes. Did you choose to rob the bank? Yes, you did. And so you are guilty of violating that command, thou shalt not steal. And so all of these things work together in some mysterious way according to God's purpose and according to the fact that he who is infinitely wise and holy is able to do these things and bring them to an exact conclusion of which he has determined for it. Now, this brings us comfort as Christians as we recognize that our God, especially as redeemed people, our Father in heaven does ordain things for us in our lives. We need not fret or worry about what those things are. We need to be, just, we need to be faithful and obedient to his word. And we need to trust those things that God has purposed. To trust the Lord with all of our heart, lean not in our own understanding, and all of our ways acknowledge him. 
he will direct our paths. And so we trust him, who is infinitely wise and holy, to guide us carefully through all of our days. Well, that which he decrees, he will bring to pass. We need not fret or worry about that. We need simply to be faithful to what he has told us. Well, I trust these times are helpful for you. I hope they are. If you have any comments or questions, you can leave me a note. The way to reach me is right before you on the screen, as well as the link to my own personal website, which I do many other things besides this devotional. I uh, spend time each morning writing a daily prayer. Right now, I'm, I'm utilizing the Psalms, working one Psalm at a time through the Psalter, uh, using that as a springboard for prayer. Um, I write other articles and matters um, as additionally, you can visit our church website, Providence Presbyterian Church. That information is there as well. So I'd encourage you to utilize those resources. And so until the Monday edition, when we turn to uh, paragraph uh, two and three, may the Lord help you today. May you serve him. May you walk with him. God bless.